Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, a guide to virtual college admissions by Josh Moody of the U.S. News and World Report. Mark and Anika will discuss, what do I need to know about state-based aid? Our question from a listener Is colleges say they are test optional, but is that really true? Can I trust them? Our interview is the final part with Lisa Prescott on the University of California at Santa Barbara. And it's also the final part with Lauren Williams on being creative with your activities in the age of COVID. If you all professional, my daughter, Lauren Williams, that would be my <laughs> daughter, Lauren Williams. <laughs> That's right. And thanks to our listeners who sent us some great feedback on uh, Lauren's interview. It's, you know, I've interviewed 40-year veterans in admissions. And before we start and hit the record button, they say, Mark, I'm nervous. But Lauren was just cool as a cucumber. Absolutely. Hey, and Mark, before we forget, I just wanted to give another shout out to Mary. Mary, I'm down to your last cookie. And man, those cookies were amazing. They sustained me. I felt like, uh, I felt like, uh, one of those prophets in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and sustained by your cookies. I made it through. <laughs> so let's tell the story here. Mary found out that Dave was in the Connecticut for the last time in a, a long for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So she hopped in her car, last second notice, drives over an hour to deliver warm baked cookies for Dave. And I said, oh, I know Dave. Yeah. He's going to share them with all the nurses. So then I <laughs> checked in with him the next day. Hey, did you share with all the nurses? He's like, they were too good to share. I kept them for myself. <laughs> I did. That was bad. <laughs> but it was very sweet, Mary. And in fact, I came down, uh, I, I worked a night shift, went to sleep, and then the uh, the manager of the hotel said, "Yes, someone came and delivered you cookies, and I was going to wake you up, but but I, I felt oh you was you, you slept all night, so I didn't have the heart." But I said she drove two hours just to deliver me cookies. So Mary, that is so sweet, and I, I truly truly believe uh, appreciate it. And in this cold and cynical world, it is nice to know that there is a true heart of goodness out there. Thank you yeah. for your cookies, Mary. Thank you, Mary. It's very kind of you. And as Dave yeah. said to me, I would have woke out of my sleep for that to meet you. I would have gotten right. and, <laughs> and and just to set the register straight, I did share one cookie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't think he's the Grinch over here. That's right. <laughs> okay, friends. I have to share with you a great conversation I had with my daughter Joy this week. And Joy's very insightful. So, you know, I said to Joy, I said, Joy, you've now had an in-person education. And now you're living in a house in the age of COVID with social distancing. Some of your classes are in person. Some are Zoom. Some are a combo. I said, in your opinion, is this a ripoff of my money? Or do you feel that you're getting great or good educational value? How do you feel about the educational value you're getting for your money? And I thought Joy's response was really profound. She said, that completely depends on the student. She, she shared a story of a recent class where they had a guest come in from career services that was going over everything, like how to set up a professional LinkedIn page, resume assistance, interview prep, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And the instruct, instructor said, now this is via Zoom, instructor said, I'd really appreciate it if you turn your cameras on. But she said, she said, Dad, most of the students didn't listen. They kept their cameras off. So she said, I was one of the few ones with my cameras on. I got to always have this one-on-one with this incredible person about all the career resources that are available. And then she gave another example of several professors she has who offer you the opportunity to attend the class live in person or take it by Zoom if you're not comfortable. And she says she prefers to go in. And she says, I'll go in. There'll be four people there. And I'll get this complete customized education totally geared to me. So she said... I'm getting an amazing education, but I can't say that 
about all my classmates. And I thought that was an interesting perspective, Dave, that straight from a student. I, I will say the reason why the other students don't have their cameras on is because they don't have their pants on. Uh, <laughs> well, well, just to prove your point, one of, one of them said to her, hey, I, I, I log in, I turn my camera off and I take a nap. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Friends, thank you for sending in all the recommended resources you're sending in. We're getting some really great recommended resources straight from our listeners. If you've got a recommended resources on the college admission process or college life and you haven't heard us tout it yet, I can't promise you that we'll feature it, but I will say I want to see it and evaluate it, and we'll strongly consider it. We're getting some fantastic uh, resources that we will be featuring up in future episodes. Now, one thing I absolutely can't promise you, we're getting bombarded by requests to come on the podcast and be an interviewee. And the majority of the time, we do turn those down. Um, College admissions officers, we take people really connected um, in a firsthand way to the college process, we will consider we have booked our interviews through 2021. Um, so unlikely, if you're trying to get your book out there or your consulting practice, we're going to tout you. But those recommended resources, send them our way. And I do want to give a specific shout out to Sylvia from Bloomfield, Colorado. Uh, she reached out to say that she recommended our podcast in a Facebook group she's in called Paying for College 101. And um, I know there are a lot of you out there that have done that. We don't always hear about it. You're promoted our podcast on your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Instagram, or whatever your social media are. And we really do appreciate it. A lot of our growth has come from our listeners passing the word on in social media. Friends, this is your last chance to sign up for Lisa Prescott's Zoom session, which will be September 15th. One hour to talk to Lisa about anything college-related. You can talk to her about UCSB. You can talk to her about admission to the UCs or anything else. We have 35 families signed up so far. Um, And so it looks like we've got a nice little group. And this is the last week I'll be mentioning it because by the time this goes live, the following week, we will have already met. But I will say this. First thing you do is you go to yourcollegebroundkid.com. And then you want to click the resources tab, and then you'll see another tab that says uh, YCBK interviewees. And so that's what you want to click and and sign up for that. You'll also see another one with Sam Prouty that is scheduled for October 13th. He is our next interview starting next week. And you're not going to want to miss that. Sam is profound, tremendous insights. He's the director of admission at Middlebury College. It's going to really be great. I encourage you to sign up for both Lisa on September 15th and Sam on October 13th. And I do have one last announcement, and that is normally in a week like this, we would have thrown all our plans off and said, breaking news, we've got to change everything. Because a really big decision really did go down this week. So a preliminary injunction was issued by an Alameda County Superior Court judge, and the injunction basically will prohibit the use of the SAT and the ACT for all California applicants to the UC system. And we would have done a breaking news for the seventh time, thrown all our plans off, but we'd already prepped for today. But we're coming with that next week. You're not going to want to miss that. We're going to be talking about test blind admissions, not test optional, test blind. So just so you know, we are following the news. We're aware that's a bombshell story. And five of you sent the article our way, which we appreciate. And we'll be talking about it next week. So tune in next week. But for now, let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Take it away, Dave. We got this week. This week is a guide to virtual college admission tours by Josh Moody of U.S. News Report, in which he says that virtual tours, chat box, and Zoom calls with admission officers all offer ways for applicants to engage. So a brief summary, Josh starts off by saying that while colleges already had virtual admission tours available, the coronavirus has made those tools absolutely necessary. 
And it starts off talking about the University of Houston and that they have virtual tours, which can be either self-guided or you can have a live virtual tour with a student ambassador. And the neat thing is the self-guided tour has the full uh, panoply of uh, everything that you can see on a tour, but the, self, but the student tours, you can specify and make more specific as to your interests or to your major. And so they found that it's a way to customize the, tu- the, the virtual tours in a way that was not possible with just a self-guided uh, tour. And they found that these virtual tours helped open up the campus to the students who are not able to make the trip. So then he talks about what is the virtual admissions toolbox. And he says that they are virtual events that include group sessions or one-on-one video chats with admission officers, all using Zoom technology. And then they say they can go on to include chat bots, live chats, and actual uh, uh, and live chats with actual admission officers and students. And then he finishes up where he talks about how to use the toolbox. And I'll summarize, Mark, because I know you'll want to fill in these details, where he says the first uh, portal you go to is the website, which he describes as the Swiss army knife of the virtual toolbox because it has so many different functions. Through the website, you can have access to virtual tours. You can initiate conversations through chat box, live chats, or Zoom chats. And uh, you can find out more information on how to customize the tours to your liking. And he closes where he talks about issues of access. On the one hand, these virtual tours clearly open up college campuses to people who cannot physically make the trip and have ways that people can interact that are more accessible than ever before. But we have to be mindful that there are technological limitations based on socioeconomics. Not everybody has a laptop, not everybody has a computer, and that we have to try and customize these tools to people who may only have access to a cell phone, and they are struggling through these issues now. Mark, is that a good enough summary to lead off the conversation? It's so good, man. I'm trying to think of what to say. You said the whole (laughs) article. It's too good. But anyway, I'll fill in a few details. So... Uh, yeah, basically, you know, this article highlights several things that are great. One is something we've talked about a lot, which is this new virtual world. You have a lot more options now to see the school from comforts of your own home. I wrote down on 11 things that were mentioned. Dave mentioned probably more than half of them. I'll just blow through these really quickly. Chat bots. Many of us know what chat bots are. We see them in the corporate world. You go on and ask a question, and through artificial intelligence, they've already you know, figured out figured out your answer and you've got a response right away. Not the most personal thing, but it can be convenient when you want a quick answer. And then Dave mentioned both group Zoom calls as well as one-on-one Zoom chats. And by the way, I'm seeing this a lot with my students now. I've got a student I'm working with um, in New England area and all but two of her schools, she's been able to have these Zoom one-on-one chats with an admission officer, something that previously would have been very rare. They would have been on the road traveling. Um, early interviews is another thing you're seeing. Schools set up interviews well before they ever had done them in the past. And David mentioned the University of Houston, adding many department tours and other special niche tours. So rather than just the full campus tour, uh, you can have your specialized department tour or even an area of interest. And then, of course, these live chats with admission officers, they can take on several different permutations. They can be just for your school. They can be ones just for a region, or they can be just ones who um, you sign up on a particular day, people from all over. Um, And then the student ambassadors. I'm personally attending a lot of these, where they'll have four different students on a panel, and you can interact with them. Uh, Schools are upping their text messaging game, and they've upped their social media game, and they have improved their virtual tours. And one thing uh, that Dave didn't mention also is moving orientations to on, online. That's so, right. So the interesting thing here about this is, one, we want to make you aware. We've talked a lot about make sure you're checking the virtual features, but we wanted to have an article that showed you how many different things are out there. But the, one of the interesting things is how this new virtual world impacts people who are under-resourced. So on the one hand, there's an opportunity for access 
for under-resourced students. Here's a quote from the article. It says, I think some of these tools have really worked for our families, says Madeline Reiner, VP for Consulting and Dean of Enrollment at EAB. Reiner adds, virtual events provide greater access, giving far-flung international students and low-income students the same ability to explore campus as families who are based in the U.S. and as families who are well-off that can travel. And as I interact with admission officers, officers a lot, they are touting this feature quite a bit. They like the democratization of the process. They like the leveling of the playing field. But here's the opposite argument. It's also led to concerns about access. So this is another quote from, this, from, this, from our article today. It says, if colleges optimize virtual admissions tools for mobile devices that can advance the mission of providing greater access, Reiner says, schools need to recognize that the only computer some families might have is a cell phone, she says. This means all of your virtual admissions tools need to be designed to work on a phone using a cellular data plan. Most students do have cell phones. So as long as things are mobile optimized, students are able to participate. And then it says, and in the absence of a reliable internet service, there may be other options such as text messaging. And so uh, that's the challenge. And then Eric Stoller also says, one of the other challenges is that the reality is that every school has their own custom recipe for success, meaning people are all over the place and what right. they offer. Um, and Dave also quoted, from the article where it says, as far as tools go, a college website is something of a virtual Swiss army knife. So it's interesting, Dave, how it, it's both uh, an opportunity for access because you don't need to travel. You can just be at home, but it also potentially can be a barrier to access if schools have not made all their features mobile friendly. And you're either in a place where you, you know, you have computer issues from, you know, reliable internet or you lack a PC or something like that. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm impressed at how things are rapidly adapting to mobile. And, and I can see how that is going to really become the, the, the crux of, of how students are going to access. A, a personal example, Mark, remember when my computer was on the Blitz and uh, we found out that CastBox, uh, one of the Squadcast, or, or squad, sorry, Squadcast, <laughs> he gave a podcast out, man. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> we listen to podcasts yeah. on. I'm always, Dave and I are always shooting each other podcasts on CastBox. Check this one out. Go ahead. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But but the Squadcast uh, was so fully optimized for my phone. The sound quality isn't quite there. So sometimes, guys, when you see that my sound is quite tinny. It's because I'm using the mobile phone app. But when you're in a pinch, I think we did one one podcast from from the seat of my car. Remember, Mark? Yeah, <laughs> so, I definitely remember that. So one. I can see I can see how uh, things are moving to mobile, and, and once they do, I can see how you know how you had that sense when when the Kindle came out, and even though you love to go to Barnes and Noble, Mark, you knew that the 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 bookstore was going to be already a thing of the past. You can already see the changing of the guard. And in two or three years, I think virtual is going to be the way to go because there's so many ways that you can optimize the campus tour experience to the individual that you didn't have when you were just showing up and like following a group around the campus. Well, there's a reason why, you know, Zoom videos, revenues um, and profits are up over 350% year to year. Um, right. We're in a new Zoom world and uh, Memo. This is not completely changing post COVID. It's just not. No. Um, no. COVID is completely an, a disruptor uh, when it comes to education and it comes to technology and education. And yeah. it's, it's true for the admission process. Some of the things that are, there's no doubt in my mind you're going to see post COVID. Right. Um, well, everybody I talked to has already told me in admissions that we're, why weren't we doing all these things before? This was crazy. We should have been doing all these things. So everybody, not a single person I've, that I've talked to, feels like the enhancements that they've made virtually are temporary. They're all saying, no, 
these are providing access in ways that we should have been doing all along. Now, I'll tell you something that unfortunately I see happening. Um, and this was already happening, but I think this is a complete, ex- COVID is completely an accelerant. And that is reduced travel on the part of admission offices. Absolutely. Uh, travel has already been starting to be reduced. Now, that's a trend that was going back, oh, 12 to 15 years. Uh, schools were starting to reduce their travel as they looked at um, expenses in their budget. Pretty expensive to, to uh, hop a plane, rent a car hotel, meals, you know, and to do that for sometimes 12 weeks out of the year, uh, that can be a pretty hefty tab. It'll still happen, but it will be not like as robust as it has been in the past. And that's going to happen for two reasons. One, the budgetary constraints that COVID is going to create for colleges. That's a nice yeah. place where you can shave some money off your budget. but also. The belief that virtually is proven to be more effective than we thought it was it going has. to be. It has. And Absolutely. so, yeah, so that's one of the things I, how one of the ways in which I expect COVID to impact admissions is less travel, more virtual. And, you know, we just wanted to, to have an article to, to highlight and underscore some of the things that are happening out there rather than just constantly saying, uh, virtual is up to its game. And this was a good article that went through 10 or 11 different things that you're seeing happen out there. What are your thoughts, Dave? Well, I just want to add one uh, stunning statistic that I was, I was listening to NPR yesterday and they were talking about how higher education is going to, is really uh, going to be subject to market forces of efficiencies and technologies that they've escaped for the last 20 years. And so they talked about the university of Notre Dame in 1970, their tuition was $4,000. And if it had gone up just by inflation, the inflation rate, the current tuition should be 20000 but yet it's $70,000. That extra 50000 represents that in the system that is going to be squeezed out now as education is affected by the same efficiencies that have affected other areas of the market. So you can see now in terms of the campus tour, in terms of recruiting, if you can replace your budget by technology, why Why wouldn't you? Because there's a, the competitive uh, economic landscape for colleges has completely changed. Yeah, and I want to I want to close by just saying this is an opportunity for you, students. You know, I shared this in in my segment with Anika. Anika and I recorded yesterday, which was Saturday, September fifth. Dave and I are recording our segment Sunday, September sixth. I mentioned yesterday in recording with Anika that that we had a board meeting. This week, I'm on a board called Go to College New York City, works with top 1% academically talented and gifted kids in New York who are under-resourced. And we have um, multiple directors of admission on, on our board. And so we had a Zoom board meeting. And this came up in the board meeting. And what, and what the, this is, is the virtual opportunity and the role video will play. More so than before. And I'm talking about student video. So organizations, of course, like Zimi will thrive with this where you can, you know, you can have your your 90 second video message and people can at least see you. But I'm talking about things here like the opportunity to set up a Zoom 15 minute conversation with your local admissions rep. That's never been greater. You know, colleges are college admissions officers are missing being on the road because there was a human contact element there yeah. and that they would get to meet and interact. And, and in, in general, admissions people, they love students. That's why they go into the profession. They lean toward extroversion more than introversion, although there's certainly some introverts in the profession. So they're clamoring student contact, student engagement. They're not getting it through travel season, which would be going on right now. And they're also not really getting it Um, by having students visit for tours. So what is supplanting that? One of the things that is supplanting that are the Zoom chats, one-on-one or even small group. And I want to close by challenging students and parents who are listening to share with their students, this is an opportunity for you. Find out what the schools on your list are offering in the way of either a one-on-one Zoom chat or a small group Zoom, Zoom chat and take advantage of that. 
um, there's an opportunity for you to learn a lot about a school, but there's also an opportunity for you to make an impression and you can be judged not just on the written component of your file, but also in some cases on the impression that you make in an opportunity like that. So take advantage of these opportunities because they've never been better. Sounds good. Should I re- remind you now, Mark, because I'm all prepared, you didn't give me my quiz. Oh, the yeah. Weekly quiz. <laughs> my quiz, man. Yeah, I got yeah. the Thanks Jeffrey. for reminding do, me. Do, do, do. Thanks for You're reminding all, me. I, I got psyched up for that every <laughs> month. <laughs> Thanks for reminding <laughs> Tell me how many times, Dave, and I get off and I say, hey, I never did an admissions tip. Okay, friends, for our admissions tip this week, we're going international student. And one of the changes I'm seeing in the age of COVID is international students for a lot of schools in the past have had to prove that they have a sufficient number amount of money in the bank before they're able to enroll at many schools. They just don't want to have students get over here and they get stiffed. Um, And so what a lot of schools are doing in the past, sort of the standard has been you got to show that you have one year of expenses in the bank and show us a bank statement. Many schools in the age of COVID are upping that to two years. Two years worth of money in the bank for international students. For international students listening, save those ducats. And for our admissions vernacular, engaged learning. Engaged learning. Oh, um, this this should be self-evident. It's where you're learning and you are engaged. <laughs> well, more specifically, it, it's it's uh, where there, there's a higher level of uh, personal, intellectual involvement with your learning, maybe with, uh, oh, I can't, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Look, man, you're fumbling <laughs> and you're bluffing and every listener That's knows right. it. That's right. <laughs> so engaged learning is really another term some schools use for experiential learning. Oh, and, yes. I and it's that. the things that we've talked about before, like it's yeah. study abroad, yeah. it's research, internships, co-ops, internships, yeah. uh, teaching, teaching yeah. opportunities yourself. All yeah. that, all those things were ways that through experience, oh, independent studies, all those things that tend to be like real life learning that really make learning memorable and make it stick. So it's just another term some schools use instead of you'll hear, instead of experiential learning, you'll hear them use the term engaged learning. So, Which is learning while you're engaged. We snubbed you, man. We got you on the easy (laughs) self-explanatory one. Oh, man. That's right. You know I'm happy when I get my guy, man. (laughs) That's because we went out of sequence. If we got into sequence, I would have gotten it. (laughs) Hey, you bailed me out. That's right. (laughs) Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Anika, quiz time. I'm taking you back down memory lane here. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the longer we get to have the podcast, the harder that is. <laughs> Remember when we were going to launch in um, August of 2017 and then we put it off six months? Mm, yes, February of 18. I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. And of course, we hired a consultant and gave us some guidance. But one of the things we did was we listened to like a boatload of podcasts. Mm, still do. Trying to mm-hmm. figure out what we liked and didn't like. So my question for you is... Do you remember which podcast you listened to that you said, oh, we need to like take a little bit of this, a little bit of that? Which ones do you think influenced the York College Bound Kid launch? I know for sure I was listening to Call Your Girlfriend, which I... I know you were. You kept talking oh, about that. Call Your Girlfriend 24-7. They are the best. They are the best. And I can't even call their names right now because I'm high on coffee, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you. I remember that's partly what made you a sound snob. You love the sound quality. <laughs> yes, too. they had the best. They have the best quality and the conversational tone and all of that about them was awesome or is awesome. Um, and what was it? It was another bit. Oh, I was listening to a lot of um, parents. Oh my God, what's the parents one? I, I stopped listening to that one actually. No reason. I just stopped. Oh gosh. 
mom and dad are arguing or mom and dad are fighting or something like that, but it was a parent. Oh, that's what it was called? Yeah, she it was so, it's so, so good. Mom and dad are fighting. <laughs> Sounds like so much drama in your life. But it wasn't. It was so, uh, okay. it, yeah, I'm sure it still is. I just, I just, it just kind of fell off my radar. But yeah, I remember those two being the biggies. What about you? Do you remember what your takeaways were from there? Like, we should try to implement this from that or this from that? I want to say it had something to do with the questions because I remember they did a lot mm-hmm. of questions on theirs. Mm-hmm. They had multiple people, so we always thought that would be a good, you know, addition. Mm-hmm. And they had three. They have three co-hosts. I'm assuming they still have it, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. Oh well, you took me back down. You did take me down memory lane. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking about that the other day, and for me, it was two podcasts. It was, it was the Sell More Books podcast. Which, oh gosh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember, I used to talk about that no, one all the yeah. time. Yep. <laughs> yeah, just I just you know once one seventy one answers, and so I was just listening to that, and a couple of things I liked about that. That's where I got the idea. They always had an article on something to do with with books and book sales. Mm-hmm. They pulled from some magazine or newspaper or something. And then they also always had a question from a listener on there. Mm-hmm. And then they also did like the intros, like the preview into each section with the kind of little snazzy music. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I remember those are things I liked from that. And then Motley Fool Answers, which I still listen to, you know, it's a lot of financial information, but there, there was kind of a nice little little banter back and forth between like the male and the female host. And I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. I kind of like that. <laughs> kind of like that, like that lighthearted vibe, not always being serious, intense at all times. So mm-hmm. anyway, just a trip down memory lane for those of you <laughs> history buffs. You want to know podcasts that influenced ours? Oh, there is a point here. If you are ever thinking about starting your own podcast, we would encourage you to do that. Like it's actually worth it to take your time and yeah, listen to a zillion of them and, I mean, I'm not saying you have to have a consultant, but I think we we certainly don't regret it. it gave us some good guidance starting out. So mm-hmm. anyway, we can get into today's stuff. I just had to go down <laughs> memory lane on once there, Nika. Awesome. I love it. All right. So today we are in uh, chapter 137 of the book that I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions. And the question for today is, what do I need to know about state-based aid? Anika, you read the chapter? Mm-hmm. We agreed in our pre-meeting, we're not covering everything in this chapter, but you're going to pick a couple, I don't know how many points I have in this chapter, maybe a dozen? Mm, yeah, something like that. Something like that. You're going to pick out uh, maybe three or so of your favorites, and I'll give. I'll do the same thing, and let's just chat. Yeah, so I want to start with this one, and it's the fact that people tend to overlook state-based aid. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, let's talk about that for real, for real, because I clearly have looked over it several times, too. Yeah, I mean, it's just literally, I think if I if I was speaking in front of a group and if I gave a quiz and I said, name all the different sources and places for which you can get money, you know, I could have, a, I could be speaking to 50 to 100 people. And I think there's a good chance that I would have to stop the guessing because nobody would get this one and I have to give the answer away. So and, and any theories on why that's true? Well, I think because we get, at least for me, I get drilled in the head about FAFSA, 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 and you're so hooked on the federal aid. And, and you know, so that alone is a job. So, you know, between that and the institutional money, my brain just doesn't go past that, really, honestly. <laughs> Are you trying to say you only count to two? Yes, three. How about three? We, I go to three I and then I that. stop and then we're covered and we're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're so funny sometimes. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Any what else? What else do you have? Well, I mean, I wonder. I just wonder why is that? I mean, can, is it because like the counselors aren't talking about it? Like, who isn't reminding us about state aid? Like, why? Why are we overlooking it? You know, the more I think about it, I think the answer is probably is mostly what you just said. That the mind normally goes to the big two things, right? Mm-hmm. Once you start getting past the big two, then you know, intention dwindles. And so obviously the biggest one is institutional by far. By far, that's the largest chunk of money, like overwhelming. It's over 80% of free money is institutional money. And many surveys have proven that. But then people may go next to the importance of the FAFSA, especially if it's someone that's going to qualify for hell money, 39% of people in the country do. Or if they need to get a loan, then they're going to have to fill out the FAFSA in order to get the federal direct student loan or parent plus loan. So that's popular. Then sometimes people's attention may go to to outside private scholarships, so, mm-hmm. you know, corporations, philanthropists, civic organizations, churches, and 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 the like. So you know, 
So that's part of it. But I, I also think a lot of it is that people just, that there hasn't been good enough marketing of it. You know, it kind of reminds mm-hmm. me last week when we did the session on CLEP. Yeah. Why does CLEP fly under the radar? There just hasn't been a strong enough marketing effort. You know, so that I really don't have an answer other than that, Anika. Okay. Well, I'm going to tie these next, uh, my, my next sure. two together, and I'm going to let you do yours. So yeah. the big one for me is the fact that it's first come, first serve. Regardless mm-hmm. of academic merit, you know, it's it's like who gets in, who gets the application in first. And also that ties into the fact that their deadlines are normally so much earlier than the federal deadline. So those two are the ones that uh, that stick out to me the next most. Yeah. And the only thing I'll say about the first in first serve is that's not always the case, but it's often. Oh, case. So, so, oh OK. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, So no one okay. make it sound like that's a one size fits all. OK. Um, just like deadlines. For the state, aren't always earlier than federal, but it can be pretty common, right? Okay. So, but those are very important ones. Mm-hmm. Those are good. Those are good. Okay, well, so, I'm stuck there. All right, so for mine, and I want to really, really, really hang my hat on this one, and it's a big one. It's the very first one that I have in my chapter. I talk about how every state has a different policy in terms of how they distribute aid, but the big one for me is where do you find this out? That's what I want to focus on here. Mm-hmm. And this could be the recommended resource. I guess you get two recommended resources today, everybody, because <laughs> I'm talking about it here and I'll still give you one there. So NASFA is an incredible organization. That's right, N-A-S-F-A-A, and it's an acronym. And it stands for the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. And they have a link, and this link is so good that every once in a while, you know, I do this, Anika. I feel like I do the teacher to the whole audience. I did this when you and I did um, when you and I did our segment on um, LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Remember that? And I said, okay, I want everybody to look up their school mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. do the search. And I we got a lot of emails on that from people oh, wow. who have been, you know, done that. So I'm doing the same thing now. I'm giving everybody a homework assignment, and I promise you that you will not regret it. So what I want everybody to do is to go to Google. Put in NASFA, you don't have to type the whole name out, just N-A-S-F-A-A, State Financial Aid Programs. So just Google NASFA State Financial Aid Programs. And when you do that, you are going to come to an awesome link. And when you come to that link, you're going to see a map on that link. It's going to be a map of the entire country. Now, this is the homepage. And you're going to, first of all, you're going to see a lot of great resources here. You're going to there's all kinds of things that you can read about financial aid in your own state, about cutting costs, about resources for counselors. I mean, there's lots of really good links, but the one I want you to focus on is the map. And it's a multicolored map. And when you go and, and you can try this for your own state, then I want you to click your own state and you will see all of the different grants that your state offers. So for example, and I'm literally doing this right now as we talk to me. So I just clicked California. That's where our larger listener base is. It's the biggest state in the country, over 40 million people. So you go to California and you can read all about Cal's grant, the Cal grant. Okay. It tells you what the Cal grant is, who's eligible, GP recovery, all of the stuff for the Cal grant. You can read about the California Chafee grant for foster youth. You can read about the middle class scholarship, which a lot of people don't know, but California has a middle class scholarship state-based, you can have up to $184,000 to still get money, you know, at both some UCs and some Cal State campuses. You can read all about that. You can read about the California National Guard Educational Assistance Award Program, C-N-G-E-A-A-P. You can read about the Law Enforcement Personnel Dependence Grant Program, L-E-P-D. You can read about the John R. Justice JRJ Program and the Golden State Teacher Grant Program. And I guarantee you, there's nobody in our audience that knows all of those things inside out as much as they should. Mm. And so somebody may be thinking, okay, stuff, you just picked California because it's the biggest state. What if you just picked an average state in the middle of the middle of the country that wasn't so huge? All right, so let me do that. So I'm clicking Ohio. Well, when you go to Ohio, you can see all your choices there. Like how many people in Ohio know about the unique opportunities for veterans, the Choose Ohio First program, the John R. Justice Student Loan Repayment Program, the Nurse Education Assistance Loan Program, these are all Ohio-based programs. The Ohio University Opportunity Grant, the Ohio War Orphans and Severely Disabled Veterans Children's Scholarship, the Ohio Safety Officers 
College Memorial Fund, the Forever Buckeyes money, and some others, such as the 2021 Motorcycle Rider Education Grant. And I didn't even read all of them. There's the Geological <laughs> Survey Grant Program and the Scholarship Search Tool. So, so what are you thinking, Anika? So is this just for undergraduate or is this for graduate too that you can go on? So mostly undergraduate, in some cases graduate. But the nice thing about this, if you use this source, it will explain them all to you. Okay. So if, it, if it's undergrad or grad, that's going to be clearly in the description when you read it. Okay. You know? So, yeah. So, I mean, it's just a reservoir of knowledge here. And I think it's it's awesome. And so the thing people need to realize is state money is your return on your investment for paying taxes for all these years. Hmm. This is your return. You've been making an investment. One of the payoffs for that are you're funding programs like this. So to pay the taxes, but yet not cash in on the benefits for lack of knowledge, mm. it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Makes zero sense. I should put it that so way. So you see, uh, you, you know, Anika and I in our pre-meeting, when we were going over this, I said, I have to take number one. You can pick anyone you want, but I'm taking number one. <laughs> like, now you see why. Leave it I was going to bring some juice. <laughs> Don't just bring us some juice. <laughs> Anything else on that one, Anika, or should I move on? Move on. That was good. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So one of the things that I would also say, is, there's a couple of simple ones. For a lot of states, your federal, your FAFSA is the only application that you'll need. So just once again, to show how important it is that you fill that FAFSA out correctly. There are some states, uh, Pennsylvania is an example of one, where you'll have specific forms that you'll have to pay out, you'll have to fill out for that state. Uh, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when we're talking about state money, this could be need-based or it could be merit-based. It could be either one. Mo a lot of states have both. Some states only have one or the other. Like up until recently, actually, Georgia and New Hampshire were the only states in the country that didn't offer any need-based aid. And now Georgia has recently added a small amount of need-based aid. Yeah. Um, most states, it's mostly need-based. More so than merit. So that's one of the things that I really, you really want to know. Is it need? Is it merit? Is it mostly need? Is it mostly merit? If it's merit, what are the qualifications? If it's need based, what are the qualifications? That's something extremely important for you to find out. And that will all be there in the description when you, you know, you read the, the fine print. And then the last thing I'll say is that the trend has been going more and more toward increasing merit based money and slightly decreasing need-based money. And I fully, fully expect that trend to continue with mm -hmm. the pandemic and schools needing needing that, you know, that middle or that upper middle class revenue that families that can pay a certain amount have. So that's that's the trend. Yeah. Any thoughts on anything I shared, Any? Uh nope. I think it's all good though. You know, I will say one thing. There was a time I used to be critical of merit based money. Mm. And even in the book I have a a quote from the Heckinger report um, about merit-based money. Ah, let me read this, and I'll tell you why my perspective has changed uh, over time. So this is what it says. 
It says merit aid is extremely controversial because research shows merit aid benefits students who are already likely to graduate from college while simultaneously taking money away from the most needy students who are oftentimes unlikely to attend, let alone graduate from college without the help of need-based aid. According to the Heckinger Report, 310,000 eligible low-income students were denied state aid in Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky last year. There is only one pot of money. So money that is given away based on merit takes away money from those who can't afford college without it. Um, and then it says, here's another quote from the Heckinger Report. Are you okay giving money to kids who already are going off to college, or do we really want to make college change the trajectory of a kid who wouldn't have had that in his life. These issues are complex. Um, so I used to be very sensitive to that. And I still am because there is one pot of money. So as you shift money from need-based to merit-based, which is what schools are doing, you are inevitably hurting under-resourced kids. But the problem is the need-based formula is just so jacked up hmm. that it's just so onerous that it's just not reasonable and realistic to expect so many families to be able to pay what the need-based formula says you'll have to pay. So that's why my thinking has changed on that, mm -hmm. even that yeah. it does hurt me that you are taking money away from kids that are the most needy. Like that's still, that will always hurt me. But I mean, I have no problem helping a family find merit-based aid because the formula is just so <clears throat> jacked up to begin with that I just can't respect it. What are your thoughts on that, Anika? Do you think it's ever going to change, though? Like, is there some hope that somebody's going to revisit that formula and get it together? That's a really, 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 really... How many reallys was that? Six? <laughs> <laughs> that's a seventh in there? Maybe one more. <laughs> okay, really. So that was a really good question. Um, I, I'm not optimistic at all. Because it's not just about changing the formula. If you change the formula, the institutions still have to have the money to be able to give you the money with the what the formula mm -hmm. should be. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it'd be it'd be like saying, you know, let's say you're a kid and you're two kids and you're talking and you're like, man, my parents are so cheap. They gave me like ten dollars for an allowance. Like I got friends at school to get like fifty and a hundred bucks, like that's just wrong. And like two kids are talking, you know, in, the, in their household. You think mom and dad will ever change? You know, <laughs> guess what? Mom and dad are broke. <laughs> 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 Does that help? Does that help to answer the question? That was the best. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got an illustration that worked. It's the first yes. time in a year. <laughs> I remember when I used Never to actually done. read my illustrations and I get twos great. and threes. That was perfection. <laughs> when I nailed. All right, we need to switch to the next topic. I can move on while I'm doing well. Before I <sighs> dig a hole for myself. Good gracious. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, this week's question, yay, from a dad. We always love when the dads chime in. Um, Greg is from Georgia. And Greg says, colleges say they are test optional, but is that really true? And we talked about this, but has it been recent? I can't remember. Well, this, this question comes up a lot because so many schools are going test optional now, so mm -hmm. we're getting it a lot. We have discussed it in the past, but... It's come in multiple times, so I wanted to do even a little deeper dive into it. So I'm going to go over it with all the nuances, and then let me know what questions you have, Anika. Okay. So well, let me ask you, how would you answer it? Uh, well, based on what I know, um, sometimes, I mean, they are t test optional in certain aspects. Like, you know, it might be test optional to get into the school, but in order to get a certain amount of money, you might have to hit a certain mm -hmm. score. So that's, that, obviously, that's the biggest one. Um, that I relate to in terms of you were always talking money over there. I know. Yeah. That. <laughs> you're the money Why lady. Not? Money Why lady. <laughs> I mean, but just that is that, you know, sometimes it's test optional in just certain areas of the of the process. So I'm gonna focus mostly on admission in this answer, because we have said that before. You do need to be extremely careful with that. Is if a school's test optional and you need scholarship money, take a look at the the requirements for their scholarships and see if there's test scores linked to them. 
Um, I see this as kind of part one of a two part answer that I'm going to give Anika, mm. because our question from a listener next week is all related to test scores. And this topic is going to come up again from a completely different perspective. Mm. So this is like part one and then part two next week in my conversation with Dave will be kind of the sequel to this, where things are going. But I'll just leave that as a little mystery, a little dangle it out there, a little bit of a <laughs> tease, get you to come back. Mm. So, so what I'll start by saying is, when schools say they're test optional, that is absolutely the goal. It is absolutely the intention. No question about it. Like that's, they, what they say is what they aspire to be. However, I, I will also say this, and this is very important. People are making decisions and people are not robots and people have biases that influence them. You've heard me say over and over, but that, that's one of the, If I had to summarize the single most important lesson that stuck with me in my time doing college admissions and my time doing boarding school admissions, Anika, it's how much people look for people like themselves without even realizing it and advocate for people like themselves Hmm. and can be harsh for people that are not gifted in areas where they're gifted in the way they judge and assess applicants when it comes to reading files. So... Um, holistic admissions is human admissions and human admissions introduces biases. So, you know, how many times have we read on a job, job application where it says we do not discriminate on the basis of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, personal handicaps, whatever. But that does not mean that there's still not some discrimination that happens in organizations. All right. That's like an aspirational statement. So with with that in mind, let me go into some of the factors that, you know, that can maybe give a little bit of an inkling. So, Anik, I can imagine a lot of our listeners are thinking, okay, it's one thing for you to say, use the parallel, the analogy of the warning about people don't discriminate on the basis of age, of age race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But how does that help me? How am I supposed to know? You know, which particular people may look at my scores or not look at my scores. And the reality is I can't tell you that exactly because there's so much subjectivity involved. Um, But I can give you some general principles that I think are worth keeping in mind as you think through this question. Uh, I don't want people to overanalyze it. I mean, people are very well intentioned when they say test optional means test optional. And every college will genuinely tell you that that's what we are attempting and trying to do. But I do believe that there are some nuances of differences from one school to the next. And that's what I want to kind of share with people to kind of look at it from this perspective. These are the questions I I ask. Let me, let me put it this way. These are the questions I ask when someone says they're test optional. One, how many years have you been test optional? In other words, are you accustomed to putting more weight on other aspects of the application or is this a new training process? Because it does take your brain a while to train to think differently. If you're used to putting a pretty big emphasis on test scores and evaluation, now you're not doing it. Is this a brand new thing or have you been doing it for a while? Question number one. So a question around that is because, okay, if they have been doing it for a short amount of time, should I? does that mean it's a red flag that I should be wary that I should still be submitting my scores or you've done this for a long time. And so you probably are a little more lenient toward being true to that statement. Is that what you're suggesting? So that's a great question. And that's the million dollar question. It's almost like degrees of trust, right? Right, Exactly. (laughs) So the most trust I would have for someone that's been doing it for a really long time. Okay. The next thing that I would ask myself is, was the school test optional before the pandemic? Um, or did they just go test optional because of the pandemic? And then if they just went test optional because of the pandemic, are they one of the schools that says we're going test optional for the foreseeable future? Or are we doing a two to three year experiment? Or is it only this year? And the reason why that's important, well, why do you think that would be important? Any idea, Nick? Well, I mean, I, I like to hear the distinction because to me, that kind of sounds the same in regard to, okay, you've been doing this a long time, so I trust you a little bit more. No, they're actually different. So what happens is when a school says, okay, we decided maybe the pandemic was a final blow, but we're just going to go test optional basically permanently or the foreseeable future, or even the two to three year experiment, 
The one, schools that say the two to three year experiment, trust me, you can take it to the bank. That means they were already internally planning on doing this and having serious conversations about doing it. So those schools are pre are sort of favorably predisposed to liking evaluating without test scores. Schools that just go this one year, they're more likely to say, you know what, I really don't like this, but there's really nothing that I can really do when kids can't take the test. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference there. You know, there is a difference in, in, in my opinion in how much I'm likely to trust a school is downplaying test scores. Now, we are getting into finute and distinctions here. I know the schools that are only going for one year will say, Mark, we're going to this option. We really mean what we say. Yeah, but if I know within your admission office that you actually think test scores present some significant problems um, and you're more likely to jettison them long term, I'm much more likely to, to have confidence that you that you are really putting less emphasis on test scores. Mm. Um, is that clear? Confusing? What do you think? Yes, no? I mean, I don't totally, totally get it. I just, um, where my brain just went that second ago was that, okay, are they still, as we're talking about these schools that are just doing it, whether it's COVID related or not, are they still using it within those, okay, we're going to use it for placement in cl certain courses. Are we going to use it for scholarship? You know, I'm, I'm going back to that question is are, how are they still using it? If, if they, how are they using test scores? If they're saying, "Hey, we're going, co we're going test optional because of COVID," or "We're going test optional because we've been concerned for a long time," um, are they still? What are the levels that they're now going to apply the test scores? I don't know. That's so. I'm mostly focusing on admissions in this answer. About I've sort of gave okay. the caveat before. You need to read the fine print to see if their scholarships are linked to test scores. Mm -hmm. And there's you get all kinds of things. You get schools that only give money away in the basis of need. Some of the more selective, prestigious schools, those schools were not using test scores for scholarships anyway. Okay. But there are a lot of public schools, and most schools, you know, that have merit-based money are linked to test scores. But to me, the scholarship question is sort of outside the realm of this conversation. Okay. If you want to know the scholarship question, you just look at their scholarship qualifications and see what it says on there about test scores. Okay, got it. Focus on admissions. I'm Focus focusing on admissions. on admissions. Yeah, okay. so I don't know if that helps you. but if you It stay does. In the admission it actually right. does. Okay. It does. Okay, good. So here's another important thing that I that is very important that I ask when I'm looking at a school's policy. What percentage of students were test non-submitters? So if it's closer to like 10%, like University of Chicago has, or like 40%, like Union has, or some years when I've looked at Pitzer, they've been 70 and 75%. That makes a difference. Um, if it's closer to like one in four or one in five, then I know that they're very used to admitting kids without test scores. When it's like you Chicago, it's like 10%. Look, are still kids still getting admitted without test scores? Yes. But the more that you are an outlier within the applicant pool compared to every other applicant that they're seeing, the more likely that the rest of your application will be go, they'll go over with a fine tooth comb and a lot more scrutiny. Mm, okay. Does that make sense? It does. Yep. Yeah. So these are just factors that influence my degree of trust. Now, Here's a story that happened this week. Um, I'm at a board meeting. Uh, I think I've shared this before. I'm on a board called Go to College New York City. And when I say I'm at a board meeting now, this is we're in this new world of Zoom. I did not go to New York this week. <laughs> Be clear, Mark. So, yes. <laughs> so I'm on a Zoom board meeting, you know, and right away, actually it was even before we even got into the official board meeting, one of the, the board members says, what do you guys think about all these schools going test optional? And I spoke up. I said, I do support the trend, but now I have to convince my students that test optional doesn't mean easier to get in. And we have three directors of admissions from very well-known schools um, that are on the board and all of them nodded their head. Like, yeah, that's so true. Mm -hmm. So that's something I just want to underscore. And we know we've said it before. Remember, I said that to you before, and again, it surprised mm -hmm. you. Test mm -hmm. optional doesn't mean easier to get in. Yeah. So I really do need to emphasize that here. That's really important. But test optional means is that instead of weighing test scores as one component in the academic evaluation, now more emphasis will be put on the courses that you took, the grades you got, your grade trends, your teacher recommendations, counselor rec, and any other testing such as AP, IB testing that may be in the file. So that's just very important to emphasize that. And so, you know, what's the bottom line? Well, you still want to look at the 25th to 75th percentile average test scores a school has. And if you are below that bottom 25, 
you absolutely should not submit your scores. Mm. I'm working with a couple of kids this year that they they look to me like they have the whole package, meaning they've got the grades, they've got the rigor, they've got the teacher recommendations. Okay, they've even got the good, uh, strong scores and APs, but they don't have strong test scores. They'll absolutely benefit this year by being test non-submitters. That will, no question, that will help them. But if you're closer, if you're like right at that midpoint of the, you know, the 25th to 75th percentile of their testing, and possibly even slightly below the midpoint, then I would encourage you to test, to, to submit. Because they're, for people that are not used to exercising that muscle, it's like a muscle of reading a file without test scores, it will give them a little bit of extra confidence that you can handle the rigor of their school. Anika and I, we're recording this at 11 a.m. Saturday morning. I did a session at 10 a.m. with an athlete who's applying to some selective schools, and he hasn't been able to take the test because of the pandemic. He like, you know, he's literally getting really good scores when he does practice tests, but he's not able to take the test. So he's going through the athletic pre-read process and communication with all his coaches, and they're like, look, we can take you as a test optional student, but honestly, the test does help. So if you're able to take it, we'd love to see it. Hmm. Now, it's a little different for an athlete. You know, one whole Rick Singer thing, you know, a lot of, hmm. a lot of scrutiny on athletics. There's just a lot of pressure on them right now. So I don't want to make a complete one-for-one -one comparison. But I also want, you know, people to be aware of sort of all these perspectives. I also don't want people to think that this whole test optional thing is a ruse, that it's a farce, that it's a, a bunch of twaddle. I, I really don't. I mean, schools aspire to be test optional. And if you're a poor tester, I encourage you to take advantage of it. But I don't want people to be completely naive that these are not robots making decisions. They are people. And if they're used to seeing numbers and they don't have them and knowing every admission officer is different, there's no doubt in my mind that for certain people, you know, it can subjectively influence their decision. I mean, the one thing you got to remember with holistic admissions, you don't exactly know why each person around the committee decides to vote. Mm -hmm. In other words, different people put more weight on different components of the application based on their own biases. So I, th I got it all out. I said everything I have to say. I just want to know what you're thinking, Anika. No, I, th I think it was all clear. And I wonder... Uh, what, remind me of the the guy over the movement, the test optional movement. Is it the fair test? Fair test. Well, fair fairtest dot org mm -hmm. is is of course the organization that tracks it. And, you know that's been zealous on this cause forever. Yeah. So do they see this as like a huge win? Like, is this a silver oh, lining in the cloud for them? You know, with this oh, COVID of course. mess. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, not only did yeah yeah like they're they're like. Uh, Doing jumping jacks, man, banging the banjo, like sending out. Because I get all the, I get all the emails, you know. And like when they say another school is up, well, you know what I mean. I can just mm -hmm. see the glee coming through my computer. Yeah. So Robert Schaefer is who you're talking about. Okay. He's the the founder of of it, and he's been really anti standardized testing since night. Really, well, strong voice on the national scene since '96, mm -hmm. and. You know, he wrote the book Standing Up Against the SAT, which came actually that came out in the, the late eighties, now that I think about it. So mm -hmm. even longer than that. I just and the reason the reason why I asked about him, because I wonder if he would be a resource for Greg and other listeners in terms of I wonder if he's speaking to these uh nuances in terms of okay, if if are they test optional if they say they're test optional? Is he speaking to any of this? Like is he is he acknowledging any of those uh concerns within the work that he's already been doing? I don't see that as what he sees his mission to do. Okay. Um, I'm sure if he was asked to be a speaker, you know, um, I remember, I just brought back a memory. I remember when Susan Tree and I, were, she was at the last second, Mark, why don't you hop in the car with me and go to D.C.? We can go see Schaefer. He's speaking. I remember that. It popped in my head. That was like <laughs> 2005. But, um, you know, if, sure, if he was asked, you know, speak in the, you know, in the question and answer session, he'd be, you know, very articulate being able to convey all these things. But, you know, he has a very strong particular bet and he's made huge inroads. And yeah, this has been a total game changer for the movement that he's behind. Mm -hmm. No question about it. As have some other factors. And remember, Nick, I see this as part one of part two. So next week, 
in my question and answer with Dave, we're getting into the major legislation that, that uh, well, not legislation, the court decision that came down in University of California this week, mm-hmm. which, you know, you may or may not be following it that closely, but basically the University of California, a judge ruled that test scores cannot be used mm. in for the UCs. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about that next week because that's different. That's not test optional. That's what we call test blind. And so we're going to talk about that next week and get into that. And that's going to be a real serious conversation. So that's why I say this is kind of part one and part two. Okay. Test optional and test blind are totally different. You're right. I'll take it for what it's all worth, Mr. Greg. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, what I hope I didn't do in this conversation was go so much into all the nuances that now people are just totally confused. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Like, like you know, can you trust a school? Yes, you can trust that it's their intent. You're still better off submitting scores if they're going to help you. If it's school is not test blind, I just wanted to go over some of the scenarios where I feel tests may carry a little bit more weight from one school to the next. Mm-hmm. What you got going on, Anika? The rest of the day. Uh, well, John and his dad have been rebuilding this Mustang. And it is officially finished. And I cannot wait. Until Are you serious? Thing up in I'm like waiting for them to pull up and drive. I know you come from a family <laughs> of car builders. I remember one time when, when you lived in, in, in Union City and something happened to my car in, in your, in, at your mm-hmm. house. Remember that? I don't even remember what it was. Yeah. Oh, that's Jalen's Mustang. He's got like a 64 and a half. John has a... But yeah. I, remember, I remember Javon got out and fixed my car. I didn't have to pay for a mechanic. <laughs> I was so happy. Yeah, they all, they're all in it. He's got John all fired up now. So I'm literally waiting for, I'm listening for the garage to open up and hear the rumble of this thing coming in this garage. So he's passing on to, is John 11 or 12? He's 12 now. Oh my God. Wow. Goodness. So he's grooming the next generation of Mm -hmm. car. So now John knows how to get out. He probably knows way more about cars than me. In fact, I know he does. Trust me, he does. (laughs) (laughs) I know he does. (laughs) I probably had like 12 or 15 cars in my life and he knows more about it's cars all than me. Good. We went to a track. I went to a track out here for the first time. They've been going, but I went for the first time last weekend. It was awesome. So I'm sure we're probably going to go again tomorrow. By the way, how'd you know I knew nothing about cars? You said that with such confidence. I've been knowing you for a long time now, Mark. <laughs> okay. I think it's time for me to leave. You, you and cars, me and math. I think we there both own that. There you go. <laughs> okay, friends. You know... If you're a regular listener, we never have an interviewee do six weeks in a row. Never had that in almost more than two and a half years of our podcast. And we did it for multiple reasons with Lisa. One, there were three distinct topics that she was addressing. Uh, The first was foster care youth and the admission process for foster care youth. That was parts one and part two. Second, admission to the UC system, part one and part two. And today, our final part of University of California at Santa Barbara. But I wouldn't have done a six-parter with her if she was not such a fantastic communicator. And we've heard from many of you that you've appreciated what Lisa's had to say. So in final part of Lisa Prescott's interview, she defines what an impacted major is at UCSB. And she talks about which programs are impacted. Lisa, and, and keep in mind, being impacted can vary in a definition from school to school. Lisa also talks about which programs have the most interest at UCSB. She talks about their pre-major plan. I asked Lisa, what do they need to do to become an even better school? And Lisa was just so refreshingly honest with me and her answer. Finally, I put her on the hot seat. I asked her seven questions and we get to know Lisa outside of her world as an admissions professional. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Let's talk about impacted majors, because that's something that always comes up when we're talking about UCs or CSUs, Mm -hmm. you know? And um, can you explain what an impacted major is and how it impacts, you know, a student looking at certain majors? What are the impacted majors that, you know, on your campus? Yeah, very good question because the word impacted can mean different things at different schools. So 
Uh, really the only area that I would call truly impacted at UC Santa Barbara would be engineering. So they have selection criteria that's going to focus a little more heavily on your math and science preparation and success in those fields because it's such a small program. Um, the College of Creative Studies that I talked about, they're going to focus more on your talent within that individual discipline. Um, but other than that, campuses that are, or excuse me, majors that are very popular that have a lot of students wanting interest, rather than making it more selective at the point of admissions, we do something called a pre-major. So you come into Santa Barbara, say, as a pre economics major, pre-psychology major, pre-biology major. And there's a series usually of anywhere from, you know, five to six classes that you take. And if you are successful in those courses, then you advance to full standing. If you're not successful in those pre-major courses, really, it's probably not the right major for you. And so, We're still thrilled to have you at the university, but we're going to tell you, you need to choose another major because you did not meet the pre-major requirements for those areas. So impacted for us usually means a pre-major and there are just a handful. But again, it's really to try to find that student early on. Like, yeah, you think you want economics, but you're not doing well in economics. So maybe that's not the best major for you. Very helpful. So what does UCSB need to do to become an even better school? Well, I think it's an issue of getting the word out. You know, it's like we use that beautiful beach and aerial photos of our campus all the time, but it takes a lot of work to explain that we don't just lay on the beach. So I think really we are a top tier university. Um, It's just a matter of getting students to think more broadly uh, and to look at us differently than maybe they have in the past. Historically, if you go way back, even back to the time when I applied to UC as a student, we were one of the easiest UCs to get into. We were considered a backup school. You know, we are no longer a backup school. Um, but sometimes, I guess not with 100,000 apps. Yeah, with 100,000 <laughs> apps and, you know, the profile of the student we're admitting, but sometimes parents you know, who know of Santa Barbara from back in the 70s still think of us as a backup school. So for us, it's a matter of fighting that public perception that it's time for you to take a a second look because we have evolved and um, grown into one of the top public universities in the country. Um, So I guess we need to do a better job of marketing, even though I really hate that word because I want students to find the school that's the right fit. But I think we're a better fit for students um, than they might realize. <laughs> you know, I think that makes sense. That may, from my experience, because if I'm working with students in California, they all know about you and they know that you're hard to get into and they respect you highly um, as they do for most of the UCs. Mm-hmm. You know, if if I'm working with a student around the country in the East Coast, Midwest, they frequently will ask me about UCLA and Berkeley. Right. So it's not just it's not just a UCSB thing. It applies to Davis. It applies to Irvine. Absolutely. It applies to San, San Diego. It's just UCLA and Berkeley are the two UCs that I'm constantly asked about. Right. If it's somebody in the Northeast, Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast. And you know what? They're phenomenal. Of course, they're phenomenal, Mm -hmm. but so is Irvine and so is Santa Cruz and so is Merced. And, you know, some students don't want to be at a large public university. They're looking for a smaller setting. Uh, You, you know, as I tell students, you cannot go wrong with any University of California campus. And we are all so different that there is a campus that probably fits uh, what you're looking for. If it's not my campus, one of my sister campuses is going to give you a great experience as well. See, you're a team player. I am Good for you. Player. You are a team player. You are. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Our recommended resource for episode 137 is the Coalition for College's Virtual Fair. The Coalition for College has 130 college members 
and they are many of the leading institutions in the country. They are making all of their admissions officers available to talk to you, one per school. The event will take place over the course of two days, September 16th from 6 to 10 p.m. and September 17th from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They have brilliantly structured this event, so they have four 50-minute sessions on the 16th and three 50-minute sessions on the 17th. Each of these Zoom video sessions, you have six choices during each time slot of a room that you will enter, and each room has either four or five colleges in it. This all may sound confusing, so let me give you an example. On September 16th from 6 to 6.50 p.m., you have choices of four different rooms. In room one, you have Mount Holyoke, Pittsburgh, South Florida, William & Mary. Room two, RPI, Smith, New Hampshire, South Carolina. Room three, American, Davidson, Buffalo, Vermont. Room four, Manhattan, NC State, College of New Jersey, and Georgia, UGA. Most of these time slots have five rooms available. Some have four. We will put the link in the show notes, but this is a stupendous opportunity for you to hear from some of the leading colleges our country has to offer. I am incredibly exuberant about this opportunity, and I'm counting down the days. Hope to see you there in six days. All right, Lisa, so time to wind down. As I told you, I put all of our listeners on the hot seat, lightning round, we call it. And this is non-admission stuff for the most part. Uh So okay. The first, yep, that's (laughs) take you out of your comfort zone. So the first question is, if you couldn't live in California, where would you live? Oh my gosh, I really struggle with this one. I, I debate between moving to Hawaii, which I absolutely love, and uh, moving abroad. I, I, I play with the idea of becoming a college counselor in Italy on a regular basis. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Love it. You're a California true and true, though, I can tell. <laughs> Second question, what is that guilty pleasure food? You know it's not healthy, but you eat it anyway. Oh my gosh. This is so easy for me because, you know, with restaurants closed, I've been totally missing it. And last week, I actually ventured to a restaurant and had French fries for the first time in months, and they were (laughs) delicious. Well, I can relate to that. I never lost my interest in McDonald's fries (laughs) from a kid. Go through the drive-thru and I'll just get the fries. (laughs) Yeah, that was easy. If you couldn't be in education, so no college counseling, no consulting in Italy or off the beaches of Hawaii, you know, um, what would you consider for a career in a second lease of life? Interesting. I've, okay, I have two because social worker is one of them. I knew you were going to say that know, after our foster care conversation. Been a passion of mine, obviously. But if you were ever a fan of the West Wing, C.J. Craig as the, you know, head press person for the White House, I always thought that would be a pretty cool job. Oh, that makes some sense. Yeah. Public well, relations. I like Good. Jake Craig, though. I don't, you know, I'm very particular about what White House I would work <laughs> in. You were ready for me. <laughs> what's, the, what's the best book you've read in the last five years? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm such a That's an the hard one, isn't it? That that's I know. Actually the hard hardest. You know, one of my all-time favorite books is Les Mis, um, but I haven't read it in the last five years. Um, I just read Where the Crawdads Sing. and Not familiar with that. That was pretty spectacular. So that's probably the most recent. I'm hoping I'm <laughs> quoting the title of the book correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the author? Do you remember? No. No, that's no, okay. You should read it because it's amazing. How do you relax? How do I relax? Well, I'm so lucky I can walk to the beach, which is 10 minutes from my house. And I go for beach walks and I collect sea glass. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're the first sea glass collector we've had. Come on. <laughs> that is very meditative. I tell students who come to UCSB, you go when the tide is low, especially after a storm. And you take your little bucket and you just contemplate life and pick up sea glass. It's awesome. You are such a Santa Barbara. Is that what is that what they're called? Santa Barbara or Santa, Santa Barbara? 
that a barbarian? Bar- <laughs> barbarian sounds a little <laughs> off. All right. Final question. What's your best advice for students and parents who are listening? Oh, gosh, it's easy for me to say, but you create so much extra stress for yourself. And remember, there are so many different colleges. There's not one that's the only one that's going to work for you. So try not to put so much stress around the process and do your homework and find fit. Forget name, find fit. That's great. So does that both apply to students and parents? They both put pressure and they both could focus not on fit. Yeah, that's an answer that works for both, doesn't it? Yeah, parents, you know, listen, my kids went to two schools that I never thought was even on our radar and they had incredible experiences and they weren't University of California campuses. So, you know, there are a lot of great schools out there and you got to find the one that fits. Fantastic. I have an exciting announcement. Lisa has graciously agreed to do like a one hour Zoom session for any students, parents, college counselors who are listening and we'll be announcing the date and time well in advance so you can get it on your calendar. And I'm sure she's open to talking about college in general, but you can focus it on UCSB. You can focus it on UCs, anything at all you want to ask. You can see she's not only a wealth of knowledge, but she's got a great personality. So I want to thank you so much, not only for your time today, Lisa, but also for agreeing to give our listeners another hour of your time and let, I'll let you hear directly from them. You may even get some applications. Great. Thanks. It was a fun conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Next week in the news, this is a big one. A judge bars University of California from use of SAT, ACT scores in admissions. That's by Bob Egelko and Nanette Asimov of the San Francisco Chronicle. Mark and Nika will discuss how do I get in-state tuition when I am out-of-state students. Sorry, Mark and Nika will discuss how do I get in-state tuition when I am an out-of-state student. A question from a listener, should my son or daughter change her email so her inbox is not so overwhelmed, or will this hurt her in how demonstrated interest is tabulated? Our interview is with Sam Prouty, the Director of Admissions at Middlebury College, on the advantages of attending college in a more remote location. And our college spotlight are the Sun Devils of Arizona State University. And don't turn us off yet, because we now have part two, the final part of my interview with Dave's daughter, Lauren. And in this interview, we do a deep dive into the Young Vote website. We start by talking about where the idea to start the Young Vote came. Then Lauren tells us what the Young Vote website is designed to do. She tells us who her target market is. Lauren also talks about the purposes and the functions of the Young Vote. And then Lauren talks to us about how she is getting the word out about the Young Vote. Then we transition and we talk about how Lauren's going to measure the impact the Young Vote is having. I asked Lauren if she plans to pursue a career in politics. And of course, I put Lauren on the hot seat. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. So how did the, where did the idea emerge? I'm going to start a website and here are the things that I want to do on the website. Where did that idea come from? Yeah, it actually came from when I was FaceTiming a friend of mine and they were saying, I don't know where I should vote. Should I do it in California? Should I do it in Connecticut? I've got to figure that out. And it was just something that stuck out to me. And then a couple of days later, when I was getting ready for bed, I was like, huh, someone should, someone should, someone should really address that. Um, and I thought maybe, Maybe I'm just thinking. That person. Just, yeah. I was like, I'll sleep on it. I'll bring it up to my parents. If it's a bad idea, then, you know, then they'll let me know. Maybe it's not worth it. And then they were really, really receptive to it. And they thought it was a great idea. And um, yeah, that's really where it started. I think I was a little bit worried that maybe it, it wouldn't be helpful to people but I, I'm glad that I'm doing it. 
So let's let's dive into the nuts and bolts of the website a little bit more. Talk to us a little bit more about like what is the website designed to do? You know, what are some of the, the sections you have on, on the website and who's your target market? Yeah. So my target market is really everyone. It can anyone can use it, but I wanted to make sure that I included common questions from college students because even during the primaries a couple months ago. Me and my sweet mates were confused. We didn't know what we were supposed to do. Um, and I think I'm even registered in both Connecticut and Illinois, but I just always vote in Illinois. And not that you have today. decades of experience of voting. Yeah, I yeah, always vote twice. like you're 65 <laughs> or something. Yeah, this is my <laughs> first general election. And I voted in a, in the local elections in 2019. And... um in 2020, a couple months ago. So, yeah. So talk to us about the Young Vote and Mm -hmm. what, first of all, what exactly is the URL for the website? Yeah, if you just look up theyoungvote.org, then it'll come up and there's, it's designed to have all the information that you should need to vote and to allow you to both register to vote, request your absentee ballot, find your polling place all in one place. And it will break things down by state and what the rules and deadlines of that state are. So, for example, if you want to know, do I need an ID to vote? That will be on the early slash election day voting, which is essentially in-person voting. And it will tell you whether a student ID is a valid ID at the polls. This is fantastic, Lauren. This is great. I'm really excited about it. And I have to admit, when I looked at the website, I was really impressed. Really impressed. Oh, good stuff. So, So I have to ask, when you do something like creating the Young Vote, then your next challenge is, how do I get the word out about the Young Vote? One way is to come on podcasts like this and have a share. But what's your marketing plan? You know, what's your strategy to let other people know about the Young Vote so they can access it, find it, and you can, you know, get a great return on your time investment? Yeah. So there are three main categories of people that I'm reaching out to. Uh, Student body presidents and student governments, small influencers like people on Instagram, for example, who have maybe like 5,000 followers and they're a local artist. And then the third category are students themselves. Nice. Who will be my student nice. ambassadors. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you know this. I, I just saw this yesterday, but Axios, this political website, which you probably know because you follow this stuff, but they're having a whole section on their website now that that shows specifically when it comes to mail-in voting, all the different rules and regulations pertaining to mail-in voting in every single district in the country. So that might be worth linking that to, you know, to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And I think as many voting resources uh, that we can have by November is the more the merrier. Uh, And yeah, mine is just broken down by state. But I think that breaking it down by district is phenomenal as well. And actually, my goal in the future is to, for future elections, to get even more specific to have uh, information that will update automatically. I guess my fear is that with everything going on with coronavirus, who knows like what the changing laws are going to be. So that is something that I check frequently. But yeah. Yeah. So is is there a way you're going to use to measure whether you feel you're successful? Yeah. So I have both analytics on my website and a lot of my social media outreach is going to be on Instagram, which also will tell you how many people have seen your posts and whether they go off, uh, go to the link from the Instagram page, stuff like that. And then there'll also be stuff on Facebook as well. But since I'm really targeting young people and college students, I found that the more that I do this, that uh, even though I thought I'd really be reaching out by email, that Instagram seems like the best way to go. No, I would agree. Instagram's great for what you're doing. Yeah. So, so do you envision potentially a career in politics? Is that something you're considering? You know, I'm really not sure. I, I go back and forth. I, I, 
I'm interested in both politics and business. My dad, once he finally came to terms with me not going to med school, said I should try to go for like a JD, MBA type of uh, type of degree. And I am actually leaning towards that, but we'll see where things go over the next three years. And yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> Great, great, great. Well, this has absolutely been fantastic. And before I let you go, we have a tradition on our podcast and you probably know this because I know you listen sometimes and every guest that comes on, we put them on the hot seat. I call it the lightning round. So are you ready? Because I'm about to put you on the lightning round, Ms. Lauren Williams. Yes, I'm ready. All right. What do you do to relax and have fun? Um, I play with my dogs and I watch Netflix. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes I just go out with friends. I go to the lake a lot. Nice, nice. So, you know, you alluded to this. I imagine with two parents as doctors uh, who just sort of assumed that you would be a doctor, especially you're very science-based and kind of on that path in high school. It may have been difficult communicating with them that you wanted to go in a direct, different direction. What was it like telling your parents, I don't think I'm going to follow your career in medicine. I want to do something different. How'd you break the news to them and how'd that go? You know, honestly, it it was something that I was starting to have doubts about. Um, I think it took me a good year for it to sink into my dad. Let's let's say that. Like <laughs> we <laughs> we had to have the conversation multiple times. You know, and he's great and everything. And at first it was like, okay, you can still have an economics degree and do pre-med. And I think it took a while for both me to really realize that um, I wanted to really go for economics and political science only and not really do the science thing. And it took some convincing. <laughs> oh, yeah. He I've heard I've convinced. heard more than one time. I thought I had this really compliant kid. I think it was her <laughs> I think it was her big master strategy, get in Yale and then tell me I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you what, he has really embraced your enthusiasm um, about political careers. And just, he's just very happy to see you finding something that you really love and enjoy. And that's kind of all he's ever wanted for you. So yeah. good stuff with that. Yeah. So question, what do you see as the biggest problem in society today? I went deep with you. You know, I think that there are two. And I think the thing is their their futures are really intertwined. And I think it's both climate change and the state of democracy. I think that if climate change is allowed to really proceed, then we always put it in terms of, oh, the polar bears are going to die. It's not just that. Like, we're going to be risking our national security, our economic safety. We will be increasing our population susceptibility to disease and we'll be more vulnerable to things like coronavirus because air pollution increases things like asthma and heart disease. So I think that if you don't have a democracy that will address that, even though the majority of the American population and global population really wants that to be addressed in a positive way, then I think I'm a little bit nervous for what my future is going to look like and the future of and future generations. Yeah, I think we all see what's the democracy is on the ballot right now in this election. So yeah. um, I can see why you would raise that as well, especially with what once again, what's going on with the mail and voter suppression? Yeah. So so you, you, you're a movie person. What's the best movie you've ever watched? I'll ask you something more lighthearted. Oh, ah, uh, goodness. I'm not sure if I have a favorite movie. I always feel bad because I don't have really a favorite song or a favorite movie. The last movie that I saw that I really liked was Joker. Oh, there you go. I yeah. guess I need to watch Joker. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was. Oh, you know what? I really liked A Quiet Place. Cool, cool. Love it. And now I'm going to ask the same thing for you about books. What's the best book you've read that's had an impact on your life? I would say I really liked A Picture of Dorian Gray when I was in high school because I first saw the black and white movie with my mom. Uh, my mom is really into black and white movies. Dave tells me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, uh... Like, I have to go watch another black and white movie with Frida. <laughs> He doesn't sound so thrilled about it, but he's trying to be the good husband. <laughs> yeah, he can normally get through one. He really likes Casablanca. But uh, 
you know, after that, it gets a little difficult for him. Especially when Frida asks him questions and she knows he's dozed off and he wasn't <laughs> following. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a pop quiz sometimes, but that's okay. <laughs> cool. So what advice do you have for parents, students, or college counselors about the college process? I would say find two or three things that you really like and do them in depth. Like I did not do, well, I think they portray a movie sometimes is that you're doing 10 things and you're a captain of the basketball team at an animal shelter. And you're kind of just doing all these different things and spreading yourself really thin for only an hour a day, if that makes sense, with each of these things. And I think you should choose something that you can really address in depth. That's actually really good advice because I can tell you when you read an application and somebody's done so many different things, but not much of a commitment to them, you just don't know what that person's going to be bringing to your campus. They're just all over the place. So it's hard to get a sense of where their contributions will be with you. Not that there's a guarantee that what you did in high school is what you do in college, but it gives you a sense of knowing the kid and at least an inkling of how you can see them on the campus. Oh, I can see this person contributing in this area, that area. So that was spoken like an admissions professional there, Lauren. That's good stuff. Yeah. In fact, that's, it's kind of my pet peeve with, uh, I guess, social media activism, I would say, where people just post a infographic, we'll say, on Lebanon or Yemen. And all these things are really important. um, And having climate change, all that stuff. But I think if you're just signing a petition or sharing what's going on in like 10 different countries, but you're not really doing anything beyond that, I feel like that's a bit performative and that you should just choose a couple things. Maybe it's race relations or animal cruelty and Talk about those issues instead of sending everyone petitions that some of you don't even sign, you know, on your Instagram stories. But that's a personal pet peeve of mine. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so Lauren, we're winding down here, but share your website uh, one last time. And then I know a lot of our listeners, and I know they'd want to help you in any way that they can. So they're not here, but I'm going to ask for them. What can a student, parent, or college counselor which is really our listeners to those with those three groups who are listening, what can they do to promote your website? Yeah. So first my website is the org, And I think by the time this airs, I'll probably have the Instagram and Facebook up and running. My launch day is September 1st. So if you just go to the young vote org also on Instagram and both share things and do things. So make sure that, you, your family, and your friends. If you're going to mail in your ballot, do it as soon as possible. And on our website, you can also probably check your ballot status in the majority of states. If you are going to go to the polls, then tell everyone to do it on early voting and not necessarily election day because the lines will probably be shorter and it will be better in terms of the pandemic that's currently going on. So I would just say to essentially tell your friends, tell your family. And also there are a bunch of different organizations, whether you want to hit me up on my contact page on the website or work with uh, Vote Save America, then you can probably find ways to contribute yourself. Friends, I'm going to ask that you listen to youngvote.org and that you share it on your social media and send a message to Lauren on her contact page. That it, so when you're doing a venture like this, it's always great to get feedback. Uh, it's totally like the fuel that keeps you keeps you going every day. And I just want to commend you for not sitting around, Lauren, and saying, well, COVID-19 has destroyed all my plans. There's nothing to do. But thinking outside the box and coming up with something creative, instructive, and informative, whether it's Spanish you're learning, what you're doing on related to environmental issues with carbon or what you're doing, you know, with the youngvote.org. I think it's fantastic. And I look forward to you doing great things in the future. Thank you so much. 
And Dave and I are already talking about, you know, planning a family reunion where we'll all get together. So you'll be hearing more about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I look forward to it. I don't know if uh, the rest of the Williams family will be around. We're probably lots out of Canada, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it work. We'll make it work. <laughs> Great. All right. Take care. All right. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stallianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show, you can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.